call to order the March 2nd County Board meeting. Please rise for a moment of silence and the pledge. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Looking for then uh, approval of our regular meeting proposed agenda. Are there any additions? Yes, Bruce. Uh, thank you, Chair Danielowski. With the uh, County Board's permission, uh, your staff would like to add a new item under uh, regular agenda. It would be item 6.4, and it would be entitled Consider Recommended At-Large Appointment to the St. Cloud Regional Airport Authority. We did prepare an RBA for the Board and did uh, uh, send it out ahead of time, pursuant to policy three days prior to add it to the agenda. Uh, but with the Board's permission, that would be a recommendation. Okay, and you want to add it to 6.4? Uh, that's what it says on Keisha's. Is that right, Keisha? Because 6.7. Oh. Yeah. 6.7. 6.7. I'm 6. sorry. 7. The RBA right. says 6.4. My apologies. That's okay. Madam Chair, I'll move approval of the agenda with the amendment. I'll second that. Okay, motion made by Commissioner Dolan and seconded by Commissioner Foley. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. That motion passes. Okay, moving on to our consent agenda. Looking then for a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented. Chair Danielowski, I'll move the consent agenda as presented. Motion made by Commissioner Foby, seconded by Commissioner Brandt. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. That motion carries. Okay, moving on to our items of business. We have some public hearings to attend to today. First one is the public hearing in consideration of the adoption of a solid waste cleanup low interest loan program ordinance. Mr. Lucas. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board. So in front of you, consideration of adoption is a low interest loan solid waste cleanup program. And as discussed during previous workshop sessions, you know, staff does an excellent job in obtaining voluntary compliance. You know, we are usually shooting for about 80, 85%, but it's that remaining 10, 15, 20% that take up a significant amount of staff time, including that of the county attorney's office, when those uh, cases are referred for further action. So this ordinance right here, if, a, if adopted by the board, could be yet another tool to push for voluntary compliance. Uh, the property owner would be responsible for cleaning up all solid waste uh, items to come into full compliance with the solid waste ordinance and other ordinances in, in the county. And then those costs for cleanup would be assessed against their property tax, very similar to that of how our SSTS low interest loan program operates. So with, with that, I'll entertain any, any questions. All right, any questions for Dave? I think it makes really good sense. Commissioner Foby. Thanks. Um, yes, makes great sense. Uh, my mic is really loud. Um, just curious how many, uh, how do I want to ask this? <laughs> uh, properties that are in tough shape right now and need cleaning up. Estimate how many properties do we have countywide? <coughs> That we've been wrestling Erica, with. Gabby, do you know how many properties, you know, I mean, you guys are out in the field. Um, 
How many properties do you have right now that are in non-compliance? So I have about seven that are non-compliance and um, some of them that are long-term non-compliance because they have quite a bit of stuff out there. And I'd rather get voluntary compliance any day of the week. Um, but you sometimes have to work for years with property owners that have a lot of debris on their property, a lot of accumulated waste over the years, because it can be expensive for removal if they're doing it out of pocket right away. Um, and that's that's just seven for this year. I mean, mm -hmm. we typically run about 25 or, or 30 cases or more mm -hmm. in an entire year, but the ones that kind of straggle along, each one of us environmental specialists, we have we have at least um, three or four that are long term. Yes, long term ones. Dave, would you uh, would you summarize that so we make sure it gets in the YouTube video? I don't know if the proximity mic picked it up. So yes. So basically, what Eric is saying is, on, on average, we we do over a hundred cases a year. So. Um, Erica may be managing about 25. Gabby may be managing about 25. We have Addison in our office and Stephanie in our office. All of them are, are handling their solid waste cases. So with about 10, 15, 20 percent of those, maybe it'd be a quarter of that. Maybe 25 percent that would be fall into that range that would could possibly benefit from from this program. But you know, we all understand that there are going to be those people that, regardless of whatever carrot you put in front of them, they're not going to. They're not going to take it. Um, and I know this is the responsibility of our office. Uh, just curious, how much you communicate with township supervisors? This is something when I talk to township supervisors that they often will bring up with me. When is this property ever going to be done? Yes. Um, I hear that at least once or twice a year from township supervisors. So, and I know how complicated it is and um, really appreciate the care and concern that you take with these property owners because there's many things going on often for these households. So I understand that, but yeah, I'm just curious. I know we don't have the masses, but probably each one of our townships has one or more, <laughs> mm -hmm. and some more than others. So um, just curious if you communicate at all with township supervisors on this. We, Madam Chair, Commissioner, we do, yes. Okay. Uh, com uh, often township supervisors will bring something to our attention. Uh, we may be working with townships on, on other items. You know, so we do, we try to get out, we try to be very visible with, with the townships because they're the ones that are going to hear about complaints often quicker than, than, we, than we are, so yes. So thanks for letting me get off topic a bit, and I appreciate <laughs> this other tool, yet also hang on to the line you said that no matter what you give certain people, and you probably know those, um, it's not gonna get done. Yes. So. I would. I know we have one later in our packet, so that we're yes. Yes. dealing with. I think with. the date on that is 2005. Yeah. Correct. <clears throat> That's a lot. Thank you. Time. This yes. is great. Yep. No, I I appreciate this tool. It'll um, be there for people that maybe it's the money component that they struggle with to get on top of this, and then waiting for the whole process to just add more costs to get to the end result of basically the same thing. Mm -hmm. We're going to start it on the front end. I think that's a great idea. Any other discussion? No, I just want to point out uh, real quick, Madam Chair, that th this ultimately saves both time and money for taxpayers. I think it's easy to look at these things when there's a, a dollar figure attached to them, but until you look at the amount of time and effort that's put into these that go long term when they don't have the ability to finance those, yeah. um, this is a substantial savings and a, a, a good investment for taxpayers. Any other questions for Dave? If not, this is a public hearing. I will open the public hearing for any comments um, about the adoption of the Solid Waste Cleanup Low Interest Loan Program. And I'll open this hearing at 9.09. Anybody from the public? Keisha, do we have anybody online? Nope. Besides our, okay. I think people that are online are just solely for All right.
anything come in through um, communication via email? Nothing came through communications, but if you want to ask for a second, if anybody online wants to testify, give them a okay. second just in case. Anybody online interested in testifying at this public hearing on this ordinance? Hearing no one and seeing no one in the audience, I will close this public hearing at 910. Okay, so we have done the public hearing component and we can move on to make the motion then to give you the authority then. So I'd be looking for that motion to approve this solid waste cleanup low interest loan program ordinance. Uh, Madam Chair, I will move that for approval. Motion made by Commissioner Fobey. I'll second. Seconded by Commissioner Dolan. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. That motion carries. Thank you, thank, Dave. Thank you. We will move on to the next one. Moving on now to the next public hearing is the consideration of amending the ordinance number 241, SSTS Low Interest Loan Program Ordinance to include small business eligibility. Dave. Madam Chair, members of the board, as also discussed during our recent uh, workshop session, in your packet is a proposed amendment to the existing ordinance number 241 that would allow for small, small businesses to apply. And to, taking the recommendations from that workshop, went through and made those, those additional changes, carving out a better uh, definition of what, a, what an eligible small business is, putting language in there for, for penalties, and um, adding brackets so that we have a little bit more room for variety of different loans that, that they may come in, because businesses may vary from a, a septic system that would be really small to something that would be rather large and very costly. So we have, I think, a good bracket for, for um, offering loans. All right. And with that, then I'll entertain any questions. Any questions for Dave? I think it's pretty self-explanatory to open this up for small businesses as well. Um, definitely these are costly upgrades when you have to do them so anything we can do to assist I think is uh, um, would be welcome from our business community so madam chair yes and just a, just a note for for the audience in general is this doesn't have to be applied to septic if they have the ability to connect to city sewer and water um, to come into compliance that would be an eligible eligible expense within this program same as the residential program Correct. Yep. The sewer access charges Correct. are identified. He's talking, Dave, about if you have the ability to hook up to municipal services, that this program can help you with those costs as well. Yes, it, it does. It does. Sorry, um, Madam Chair, Commissioner Dolan, I didn't, I didn't hear that. I'm not picking up your, your oh. mic. So I'll bring it closer for, for next time. <laughs> <laughs> He's so soft-spoken. You're good. Tim, Tim answered my question. So <laughs> yes, it was just a point of clarification for the audience more than anything. So yeah. Okay. Any further questions? If not, this is a public hearing. I will open the public hearing um, at 914. Anybody wishing to address the board on this topic of considering amending the ordinance number 241? SSTS Low Interest Loan Program to include our small business eligibility. Please come forward, go to the mic. Is there anybody online that would wish to testify to this ordinance amendment? <clears throat> Hearing no one, seeing no one, we got no email correspondence either. All right. Then I will close the public hearing at 914. Bring it back to the board. Looking for a motion then to approve the public hearing in consideration of amending our ordinance number 241. I make a motion. Motion made by Commissioner Brandt. 
I'll second, Madam Chair. Seconded by Commissioner Dolan. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. That motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Madam Chair, uh, I want to go back to the adoption of the solid waste cleanup okay. program. There was a second action item in there to amend our budget. We budgeted $100,000 in that account. And so I'm, I'm asking the board to approve an amendment to that budget, increasing that line item to 250000 That would allow for low interest loans to occur and also include some court authorized cleanups that, that, that is going to be happening this year. Yeah, I apologize for overlooking that nope, one. Nope, I didn't bring it to your attention, so I'm, my apology. Yep. Um, so then I will be looking for then a motion on our first item of um, approving the solid waste cleanup low interest loan ordinance and wishing to amend the fund number 21 from department 391 program 411 account number 6801 from the budget amount of 100,000 to 250,000 in order to provide the low interest loans and cleanups for the remainder of this year. Madam chair, I'll make that motion. I believe we already did the first part. Correct? We did the first you, you, uh, part in adopting adopted the ordinance it. change. The uh, adopted it. He so wants we just us to, need yes. the right. amendment. Budgetary. Yeah. Just right. so budgetary the budget. piece. Yeah. Right. So that's what I just, yeah, I just read that as the budgetary piece for that motion. Okay. Okay. And there was a motion made by Commissioner Brandt and seconded by Commissioner Dolan. Any further discussion? Actually, it was the other way around, I think. Okay, I'm sorry. Well, didn't you make the motion? It's yeah, yeah. either okay. way is fine. Yeah, I second it. All right, so motion was made by Commissioner Dolan and seconded by Commissioner Brandt. Let the minutes reflect that. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank you. Apologize for that, uh, missing oh. that second piece of that. All right, moving on to our next public hearing is the tax abatement for Sport Tech LLC. Mr. Weber. Good morning, Good morning Commissioners. And I. Yes, and, and Mr. Um, Commissioner Dolan is going to recuse, him, recuse himself from this discussion. Good morning, Commissioners. We have received a tax abatement financing application from Sport Tech LLC. So prior to the public hearing, I'd like to do a real quick overview of the project, if you allow me. Please do. Keisha's going to bring up the PowerPoint. So this is the existing building in Elk River. It's in Nature's, make sure I have this correct, Nature's Edge Business Center, second edition right now. And you can see on the photo, the aerial there, there is expansion area to the west, and that's where this project would go. Uh, it's an 100,000, 105,000 square foot existing facility, and the expansion is expected to be 91,000 square feet, which would add about 2.8 million in taxable value, which equates to 99,000 in property taxes, of that, the county's portion is about $26,035. So the request is to abate the county portion for 12 years for a total of 312420 And just so you know, the existing building is currently getting a 12-year tax abatement agreement. And by the time this would kick in, that would be six years in. So if we look at the chart, you can see the original building is six years in by the time this new project would pay taxes in 2023. Because it's on the same property, it did exceed the 15-year tax abatement that the county's allowed without the approval or the denial by the school district to also participate. The school did deny that, so we are allowed to go past the 15 years up to 20, which is actually 18 in this case. No particular portion of the building would get an 18-year abatement. There'd be two separate 12-year agreements. Uh, they currently have 200, 322 employees, and this expansion would add an additional 85 at an average salary of about 39,000 with an additional almost $5 in benefits as well. So if you look at the economic impact, I know it's been a while since we've had an abatement in front of the county board, but we always do an economic impact of what it would um, add to the economy. And the main column we wanna look at is the value added. That's the GDP. It's over a $10 million annual impact to the economy. And those 85 jobs with the ripple effect of induced and indirect would add up to about 128 jobs in the local economy. So it's a fairly good sized project. Uh, when we review this, we always score these. It did score as a 45, and if you look at our chart, 
that is in the high range, so they would be by policy eligible for 100% of the abatement request. This was presented to the county EDA on February 16th, and they did approve it, approve the uh, resolution for this project. And just this is a little history of the current county tax abatements that we have. You can see right now in 2023 when this would go live, there already are $145,000 in commitments. And if approved, this would add about 26,000 to that um, expenditure item. But they do have several dropping off over the next couple of years. So I know I went through that real quick. Anyone have any questions? Any questions for Dan? All right, hearing none, this is a public hearing. I will open this public hearing to address the tax abatement for Sport Tech LLC. And before I do that, um, I know that we have Jim Gomstead on He's the line. He's the CEO of the company. And he would CEO like of the company words. on the line. Um, Jim, did you want to make any comments before we open the public hearing? You're muted. Okay. Can you hear me now? We can hear you now. Thank Sorry you. Sorry about that. You'd think with the 10,000 Zoom meetings I've been in lately, I would have had <laughs> that figured out. By now. You're <laughs> muted so is, the, is the is the line of the year. Yes. Yeah. So, so good morning. Yeah, I'm Jim Bonset. I'm the CEO of Cortec. Um, thank you for letting me plug in with you directly. Uh, first of all, on behalf of myself, the leadership team, the 322 plus growing families at the Sport Tech team. I'd just like to thank you for your consideration of these incentives for our company. I've been lucky enough to be a Sport Tech for 11 years of our company's 25 year plus history with the city of Elk River and Sherburne County. I can, I can tell you the ongoing support of our business at the city and county level always leaves us feeling supported by our community and it keeps motivating us to invest here locally and, and keep growing with you. We, we do not take your support for granted, but we do count on it, it's greatly appreciated, and it, it plays a big role in, in the decisions we make. Um, so again, thanks for the consideration today. Glad to you know answer any questions, but we look forward to keep growing with uh, Elk River and Sherburne County. All right, thank you, Mr. Glomstead. Any questions from the board for Mr. Glomstead? All right, hearing none then, this is a public hearing. I will open the public hearing at 922. Anybody wishing to come forward and address the board on the tax abatement for Sport Tech LLC? Anybody online wishing to comment on this? Did we receive any emails? All right. Seeing no one coming forward and hearing no one, I will close this public hearing at 923. Bring it back to the county board. All right, what are the wishes of the county board? I will be looking for a motion then to um, approve the resolution number 030221-AD-2032 approving the request for abatement for the county property taxes relating to the expansion project of Sport Tech LLC. So moved. Motion made by Commissioner Brandt. I'll second. Seconded by Commissioner Foby. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. That motion carries. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Mr. Glom said you okay. have a great day. We'll see you all in the fall for ribbon cutting and a sandwich, okay? We'll be That'll be great. To it. That'll be great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. All Take right. care. You too. Okay, moving on then to announcements. Thank you, Board correspondent. Bruce. Thank you, uh, Chair Danielowski. Just a couple of quick announcements and then a note on correspondence. Um, couple of things that are uh, occurring in the future calendar that I wanted the board to be aware of. First of all, we did receive notice that effective March 15th, uh, criminal jury trials may start. So we will see more activity in the court wing of the building and we'll be adjusting both our security and our COVID protocols accordingly. 
Uh, second of all, if uh, you have been tracking the state uh, budget, the news got uh, significantly better this last week. Uh, the state is now projecting a general fund surplus of $1.6 billion for their fiscal years 22-23. Um, and a positive balance going forward of about $700 million for fiscal years 24 and 25. The caveat is that does not include inflation. If you do look at inflation, the effective surplus is about $600 million, uh, which is still much better than the forecast, but uh, it doesn't mean there's dollars falling off the trees in St. Paul yet. Uh, however, it does uh, change the outlook for the legislature uh, fairly significantly, and you'll be hearing more if you've not already read some of that information coming from MICA as well as AMC. Um, in particular, AMC had some contingency requests to the legislature should money uh, funding be more feasible. So I think you'll see a little more what I'll call offense in some of the legislation moving forward. On the federal level, uh, just to note as well that on Friday, the House of Representatives did pass a $1.9 trillion COVID relief package. Um, it is going through the Senate process, as you know, this week, and <clears throat> we anticipate that there will be action of some sort by the middle of March as well, as there is a March 14th deadline to extend uh, unemployment benefits at the federal level. Currently, uh, that relief package does have $350 million in there for state and local governments. Um, the potential is, uh, is that uh, Sherburne County, uh, if everything held within the House bill, could receive uh, somewhere north of $19 million for COVID relief. So about uh, one and uh, two thirds size of what we did last year with the $12 million program. Um, of course, there's too soon to tell what that restrictions are, what the goals are, what the mandates are, and most importantly for us, the timeline, which hopefully would be over at least one year and perhaps more to deal with the business and economic impacts of the, of the pandemic. Uh, but that's a significant amount of uh, resources that uh, that you can imagine we would have to have a lot of discussions about. Um, but uh, we'll know more again this week uh, as the Senate takes up that activity. A couple of other uh, quick updates. Um, you know, the Minnesota State Legislature has also been very busy, uh, and we've been quite active down there. Uh, we are working to finalize the technical corrections to the bonding bill from last year that's related to the county state aid highway uh, for US 169 interchange. Uh, we did receive $2 million for that. Um, there's a, a disagreement between two parts of the state government about the language that's used for these types of projects, whether it should have been trunk highway bonds or geo bonds. It has nothing to do with our project, but we're caught in this kind of clarifying world. So we've been working with that, and Andrew has taken the lead on that. Uh, in addition, we do have jacketed a bill to request construction funding for the same project. And that was, uh, has it been introduced, Andrew, or is it just ready to be introduced? Uh, ready to be introduced. So uh, we don't anticipate, of course, a, a, a local bonding bill this year, but we do want to get the bill jacketed in the process. And Andrew, of course, continues to chase uh, federal funding dollars also for the construction of that interchange. Uh, in addition, uh, uh, Jody was able to testify last week on House File 1202 relating to uh, waiver uh, flexibility and waivers for uh, health and human services, very specific targeted bill. And the Senate version has been jacketed and we do hope that that will move forward. Um, and we are supporting other uh, legislation not directly related to the county, uh, but whether that's through MICA or AMC, including um, the uh, county recorder, uh, Michelle Ash will be testifying today and Commissioner Foby uh, will also be testifying on behalf of AMC. Uh, finally, a couple other notes in the in the legislature. We are also tracking very closely the ongoing budget discussions regarding community corrections. Um, there was, a, a, in essence, a shot across the bow. Um, the Department of Corrections put in a bill that basically gutted funding for community corrections, uh, which would have a very, very significant impact on Jay's budget and, and your levy next year. Um, Really, the intent of that was to force the question about the model and whether or not there needs to be significant reform. To do that in a, bu a budgeting year is very difficult, so we do anticipate that Comer Heads will prevail. Traditionally, the position is bad and the state needs to fund more for community corrections because the statute calls for 50% funding and we get somewhere less than 30%. But uh, we'll see where that goes. So that's a kind of a large issue for us. And then finally, um, just a, a little side note, uh, your, your handling of the public hearings was really totally appropriate because there are a series of bills 
dealing with remote communications, remote technology, and codifying that going forward, including one which would require that if you have online meetings that people can, in fact, testify online. So it was very appropriate what you did today, and I just thought I would note that, that we're tracking that one as well. And then uh, with respect to correspondence, I think there's two pieces in your packet. Uh, and uh, the most important one is the board had directed that a letter be sent to uh, Region 7W. And uh, so the letter that went out uh, is there, and I believe that uh, Chair Daniel Lowski will talk about that later. Any questions for Bruce on his updates? All right. Well, thank, you. thank you. Okay, moving on to our open forum. Anybody wishing to speak to the board um, should have signed up for the open forum in the back of the room. Keisha, do we have anybody? There is nobody signed up, Madam Chair. All right, thank you. Okay. Under our regular agenda, first item on the regular agenda is to consider the abatement of the solid waste cleanup of 29172 143rd Street Northwest in Zimmerman. Ms. Beyer, welcome. Hello, members of the board, Madam Chair. Um, the department today is here to request the approval for the contract for services as listed in the RBA um, with Trilogy Properties of Minnesota LLC for the abatement and solid waste cleanup of the property located at 29172 143rd Street Northwest in Zimmerman. And the amount to be approved by the solid waste administra administrator so as to complete the court ordered and approved abatement action. All right, any questions for Erica? Do we have any pictures of that? Oh yeah property that is ready to go up on the screen. I'd like the people in the public who are viewing to understand when we discuss these things what it is that um, we're dealing with. Right. There should have been an ins it is. inspection report. Mm -hmm. Here we are. Okay, thank you. And this is the property I think that um, you have dealt with off and on since 2005? Um, they've been in and out of compliance for a while, but um, their most recent uh, was 2018, and I attempted to gain compliance voluntarily over the course of the past three years and just was in, unable to do it. So. But they have been on the county's radar since 2005, basically. Yeah. So a lot of times what happens with some of these properties is they will um, get a violation. We go out there. They, they actually clean up the violation. And sometimes they go in and out. Um, sometimes people are chronic um, with their violations on the solid waste ordinance. And I think there's one thing that the public has to understand, too, that these are in um, community developments. So there are neighbors that are around. Um, and I think that it has been shown that, I know, for example, in the city of Big Lake, there was a property they were dealing with that was in a cul-de-sac. And one of the neighbors in the cul-de-sac was looking to sell their property. And the realtor came out and point blank said, you will probably have to lower the value of your property by about $20,000 due to what is what your neighbor's property looks like. So these are reasons why we look at these issues and we take them very seriously. Um, and they get to this point and they need to be addressed. I mean, plain and simple, they have to be addressed. Um, that's just my uh, soapbox uh, uh, spiel on why we do these things um, and why we are so cautious in dealing with them. and. We are patient, I think, beyond patient at some points. So any questions then for Erica on considering this abatement? No. Then I would be looking then for that motion to consider the abatement for the solid waste cleanup at 29172 143rd Street Northwest in Zimmerman. Madam Chair, I'll move to approve that contract. Motion made by Commissioner Dolan. I'll second. Seconded by Commissioner Foby. Any further discussion? 
Now, just for clarification for the public as well, this will go on um, the property taxes to the property. So what we are spending now will get charged to and assessed to the property. So the public understands that Correct. that is how that process works. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, hearing no further questions, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. That motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, moving on to the hazardous building resolution, item number two on our agenda. Resolution for 030221-AD-2029, ordering the razzing of um, PID numbers 35409-1332, also PID number 35-409-1334 and along with 35409-1314 and 35-409-1316 at 25457167th Street Northwest in Big Lake. Mr. Mesher. Good morning, Madam Chair. Moshler. Mosher, I'm sorry. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board. Um, I'm here this morning. Gabby's kind of sitting in on this too. It, it involves solid waste along with the raising of a structure. So we are both here um, asking for a motion to approve the resolution, um, ordering the landowner at the property you mentioned, 25457 167th Street, Northwest Big Lake to first and remove the hazardous building of the property by demolition and properly dispose of the materials and the debris. Secondly, remove and properly dispose of all solid waste items from that same property. As you mentioned, there's four different parcels involved in this. Um, obviously you have that, you've listed them all. Uh, they were in your packet. Um, with that, I have deemed that structure as an unsafe structure in accordance with the Minnesota State Building Code and that's code states that all unsafe structures, buildings or appendages are required to be, are a public nuisance and are required to be abated by repair, rehabilitation, demolition or removal according to state statutes. This abatement for the building stems back to a fire that heavily damaged the structure to a point of no repair. So that's why I'm requiring the demolition of the structure and removal with all those costs going back to the homeowner for both the removal of the structure and the solid waste items. So there are pictures again in your packets uh, showing the condition of the structure along with the solid waste that has accumulated on the parcels. With that, I don't have anything else. Gabby, do you have anything you want to add? Nope, except there's any questions. Okay. Yeah, Good. with that, we'll just... Any questions right. for either of us? Are there any questions? Madam Chair, I have a quick question. Yes. Is this, uh, I would imagine that because of that fire, there was no homeowner's insurance to cover this. Is that something that's typical or do we run into that often? That, I, do you know anything about that, Gabby? I don't know if there was any insurance involvement personally. Good morning, Madam Chair, Commissioners. We are not aware of any insurance, homeowner's insurance. Um, the occupant of the property was the brother of the deceased owner, and the owner is now Leroy Knorr, who is the father of the deceased owner. Okay. Madam Chair, okay. just a little bit of background. Um, as Gabby mentioned, the property owner, the nominal property owner, has been deceased for many years. An elderly gentleman, his father, um, who owns it and who's been paying the taxes on it, but I don't know that he's been maintaining any insurance. There's a brother that's been living there, but is not the owner. This is an example of a property where you would think we would be able to immediately go out there and fix this hazard, but there is a cumbersome and lengthy process we are gonna have to go through. Because what we are doing is eventually, if the property owner doesn't do it and the property owner is deceased, we're not really expecting the elderly father to go and do this or fund this. Um, we're going to have to publish notice. We're going to have to go through a long process. Um, assuming that the order is not complied with, we're going to have to go to court to get authority to go out there to do it ourselves and to assess it back. 
And this is one of those instances where the cost to do this is going to far exceed the value of the property. So we are gonna have to do this for public health and safety reasons, but it, it may be that we never see the money come back, okay. which is part of the reason why we are so careful in trying to get voluntary compliance with this. Mm -hmm. It's part of the reasons we, we did that loan program to try to get voluntary compliance, because we will have properties like this where although we can assess, it's likely that the property is gonna go tax forfeit at some point. Okay. So um, there will not, you will not see an immediate bulldozer out there um, raising the building, but it will, doing this allows us to do it sometime this summer. Okay, my question too is, um, the property owner is deceased, how can a, how can there be any le legal um, of a deceased property owner? Doesn't that automatically go to someone in the? By law, it, assuming the property owner, we have no information that he was married or had any children. Okay. So by law, it would go to a surviving parent. And his our understanding is his father is the only surviving parent. Okay. So it transfers to him by law. Um, so assuming that there, I mean, we don't know that there was a will passing it to anybody else. We're not able to find that out. Um, which is why we're going to have to double up our efforts to make sure we're doing all possible notification, including four weeks published notice, okay. before we come back to the court. Have you been able to make any contact with uh, um, the person who is? The fa Gabby talked to the father yes. last week, okay. I think. Yes, Madam Chair, I spoke to the father on February 26th, and he is aware of the process that we are um, proposing today the resolution. He's also been sent a copy of the resolution as um, you know, an FYI and has asked us to follow up with him to let him know how things are progressing. Okay, so then he's um, agreeable the way it sounds? Yes, he's agreeable. Um, he understands that the property does need to be cleaned up. He's just not physically able to do okay. that. So. And is there any ability for us in the regards that he seems to be working with that thought? and I'm sure it's maybe a money constraint and he can't physically do it, would this be something that this loan program that we just talked about would be able to assist so we can do this on the front end? Once the loan program goes into effect after we've um, published it, um, it's possible. I don't, I don't want to speak out of turn, but I don't know. Explaining to the pro I would like somebody to have legal representation, okay. ideally, to understand the consequences of agreeing to us um, going onto the property and the costs that are going to be assessed back. Okay. Because in this particular instance, our costs, I mean, I don't know, Gabby, if you have a guess as to what this is going to cost, but it's going to far out exceed the value of the property. And I want to make sure a property owner, before they agree to allow us to put that cost on the property, understands the implications of that. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any other questions? Nope. Okay, then I would be looking for a motion to approve this resolution. Um, and I'm not going to read the whole thing again. I think I was clear on the first round. Um, so looking for that motion to approve um, this request. I'll move right. approval. Motion made by Commissioner Foby. I'll second, Madam Chair. Seconded by Commissioner Dolan. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. That motion carries. Thank you guys for all your hard work. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, moving on then to our next item on our agenda is going to be discussing and authorizing the application efforts relating to upcoming, I know these are acronyms, infra and build federal grant opportunities. Mr. Witter. It's got to be government if you have acronyms. I know, it's got to be. And Absolutely. I'm sure that, that Andrew knew, knows exactly what all those letters stand for. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair, County Board Members. Um, I, I would tip my hat to you if you do, because being on the 7W Board for 12 years, even, it's like, right. yeah, right. <laughs> I do know that INFRA stands for uh, Infrastructure for Rebuilding America, so. There we go, okay. No, I appreciate the opportunity this morning in a couple minutes just to talk to the County Board and, and get some feedback in regards to these two federal funding opportunities specific to our number one uh, legislative priority, and that's getting the construction of 169 and, and County Road 4 interchange. Um, 
As we know, the, the federal administration has been changing over the last number of months. Uh, these programs are not new to us. Um, we've been aware of them. However, over the last couple of months with the new administration, some of the criteria, scoring, and requirements have changed in regards to these, well, specifically today to the, to the infra uh, grants. Um, it's going to require us to go back and, and do a substantial amount of work to the previous application, previous build application that we had last year. Um, a lot of times these infra grants and these build grants go hand in hand. Uh, they tend to be fairly similar to one another, um, but with the changes, you know, it's going to be a substantial rework to our application. Um, it does become an investment at that point uh, with us requiring the assistance of our consulting friends in the industry, uh, being able to collect that data, pull all of that together. Um, I did include the, the build application from last go around last year. It's very involved, very in depth, very technical. Um, so with that being said, the infra grant was released on February 17th. Very quick turnaround um, with them being due on March 19th, less than a month. Typically they give us two to three months to get these in. So we gotta, we gotta get all our ducks in a row and make sure that we're ready to go. Um, I've already been in contact and had conversations with our um, partners in this, specifically their consultant that helped us put together the build grant. There will be some efficiencies in utilizing them again, and we're looking for them to provide us a scope of services, which we can in turn bring to the county board for consideration at the next county board meeting. Um, there are two new criteria within the infra program, infra grant program, um, specific to climate change and environmental justice as well as racial equity and, and barriers to opportunity that we need to address. Um, we're able to utilize our consultant friends to um, gather that information and, and get that assembled for the, for the grant opportunity. There are a couple of different categories within the infra grant program that I'd like you to be aware of. Um, there's a large project category for projects of at least $25 million. That's where we would fall in. The other category that we would also fall in is, is the federal government is required to award at least 25% of those projects to rural projects. 25% of those funds to rural projects. Um, so that's good news for us. So I wanted to get in front of you just to make you aware of that. Um, the, the contract that we saw for the build grant was around about $35,000 to get that application pulled together. We anticipate seeing something fairly similar with the significant changes um, to the grant this time. The good news is, is that the build grant for 2021 has not been released yet. Technically, it was released and then it was retracted again to make some changes for the new administration, but it has not been re-released again, and we're anticipating that will come out sometime in the March-April time frame. Um, so there will be some cost efficiencies because we're going to need to pull this information together regardless of applying for the infra grant or the build grant, and likely I'm anticipating probably both. With that, I will open it for any questions and, and comments in regards to um, us pulling together that, that grant and that contract and, and working towards some construction funding. I think maybe one last note. Um, as Administrator Messel mentioned earlier, we are, are working also with our state lobbyists to seek construction funds through um, the state legislature. Um, so trying to get as many opportunities rolling as we can and, and see if we can't get this project funded in the near future. Questions? Any questions? Yes. Uh, just a couple of um, expounding comments. Uh, as Andrew said, even though it's a short timeline for this grant application, we know we would have to do the same analysis for other future grant applications. They're, they're clearly, as you can expect with any new federal administration, a shift in priorities. And I think Andrew and I want to highlight for you that shift is bringing in two new or, or re, 
reweighting or rescoring two criteria. One is is really what we we'll call equity, mm -hmm. and the other one is really what, what I guess you want to call what accessibility, Andrew. Um, not, yeah, as I mentioned, it was the the climate change and environmental justice impacts. Yep, was the okay, first so one. environmental justice. Yeah, thanks. Yep. And our 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 first take, without going through the analysis, is will probably be minimally um, qualified on those carriers. There, there's just certain things we can't do, but especially in where we're at to emphasize those things that we do well, such as uh, the connectivity, the transportation, obviously some of the uh, climate change areas we'll have to look at more specifically, but we will be limited. And I think we have to be re realized we're gonna be scored differently going forward with some of these criteria. Um, and as Andrew alluded to, the counter is there may be rural projects. So all of a sudden where we've been more of a, a suburban urban county, because of the new scoring criteria, we may actually be more considered rural simply because we don't have some of those equity and social justice demands on our system. Um, so it's a new world and we need to navigate through it. And our recommendation is to get going fairly quickly because this will be the baseline for at least the next four years of, of federal funding. So then I'm, I'm hearing that um, in regards to pulling the information together and the costs associated with it is going to help us into the future for other applications as well. So it isn't just Absolutely. money being spent just on these possible applications. It's going to carry us forward. Correct. Okay, perfect. Um, just to make sure that the viewing public understands that when we do these things, we do them in regards to, we understand this is all taxpayer funded grant programs um, and we all pay taxes. Our, our goal is to get back as much as we can out of that tax dollar that we pay to come back and help our community, our county, along with the taxpaying residents in it. So that's why we do these things. So just for that clarification and understanding. Um, these are good things. Madam Chair. Yes. Andrew, and this shouldn't have significant budgetary impacts either. This was more or less, some of these efforts were already budgeted for this, these studies as well. Correct. Madam Chair, Commissioner Dolan, thanks for the question. Yeah, so, so we, have a do, we do allocate a certain amount of funds every year for grant solicitations, and this would be something that is already included in our 2021 budget. All right, yeah, I just wanted to make that clear for everyone that it, it was a budgeted expense yeah. already, mm -hmm. so. And we did want to get to you early so that we, even though we're kind of hot boxing this early grant because it's such a quick turnaround, we don't anticipate the um, the vendors going to charge us more because it's a shorter turnaround. So yeah, I mean, while we budgeted for it, I also don't think it's going to be a rush job, so. Perfect. Any other questions for Andrew? If not, then I'd be looking for a motion to authorize the county preparation and submittal of applications for the upcoming infra and build federal grant opportunities. I'll move approval on that. Motion made by Commissioner Foby, seconded by Commissioner Brandt. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. That motion carries. Thank you very much for your hard work. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Okay, moving on then. Oh, we're gonna have our COVID-19 pandemic update. Perfect, so Bruce, are you kicking this off? Um, I think I'm just gonna ask uh, Nicole to just go right into it. Okay. Um, you know, my only administrative update was uh, noting the courts. Although as Nicole gets ready here, I, I would, I guess, flag to you one thing. I don't wanna hopefully get you too off focus on this, but um, long-term, uh, Tammy has been in conversation with other human resource administrators and more and more counties are starting to look at July 1st as a possible kind of shift more or less back to um, regular or more regular uh, operations within county facilities. So some, as you know, are completely closed still. Some are completely open. We're, we're in the middle. But Tammy is sensing that. So over the next several weeks, we're going to put together some scenarios of what that means for long term. Uh, so I can't say we're climbing out of the pandemic and the response. We're, we're clearly in the middle, midst of it, especially with, in terms of vaccinations. But at least from a planning standpoint, we are looking forward and ahead a bit to see what the future holds. And there's a lot of reasons why for human resources, summer is a good time. Obviously, families are 
not dealing with school issues. We should have a better handle on where things are at. Um, and so just so you know, we're starting to look ahead a little bit. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Nicole. Hi. Good morning, Commissioner. Good morning. Good morning, Commissioners. So again, starting with our 14-day formula, this has been kind of a regular item for you to see. We continue to have a really nice decline um, from that November to February date. I would say though, we're watching for some potential spikes up in that as we see schools reopen and a lot of our local businesses start to have increased capacity. And with the variance of availability here in Minnesota, we, we might see some peaks up, but we're certainly expecting that. And you know, we feel that the mitigation procedures are pretty well in place that we can address those quickly um, to really decrease the spread. So- um, I to see, like you said about the schools, yeah. you know, Elk River is the first one in our county to go back to um, full um, in school. And I think Becker and Big Lake are gonna be following here shortly uh, around March 14th, I think, or something of that nature. So it will be interesting just to see how that tracks. Absolutely, and some of our neighboring counties have already went back in person and you know we can kind of watch them as an example too how they're doing and navigating that. Uh, and again, around our surrounding counties consistently, you know, we're all kind of in that 19 to 20 some range um, and really doing quite well there, especially when you look at the deep red we were in in December. So great progress there. Last time we talked a little bit about, you know, are people still testing and what's that positivity rate? So this really kind of addresses that. So in the seven day rolling average, the positivity rate is about at 3.7% for Minnesota. And anything um, above 10 is considered high risk, and we were there in November and December. Um, and in that greater than five is caution, and we're in that 3.7. So we're really looking pretty good with positivity rate right now. Again, we would continue to watch this, so if we see some spikes up, that you know we would make sure more mitigation strategies are in place. And then the number of test testing down there on the right, um, we're at 300 and, what is it? 323.7 weekly tests per 10,000. If we start to dip below that 200, that's a, a place where we need some caution. People aren't getting tested at the, the rate that we would want them to. And if we get really low below that 100, again, really concerned that enough people aren't testing, we don't know what we're dealing with. So we're kind of in that sweet spot right now. It's a good thing to see. Um, when we look back previously, we had really low um, testing rates and that's because testing wasn't available. That's not the problem today. So I think we're, we're in a good spot now, but we'll certainly need to be watching that testing rate. I know new recommendations came out for schools um, and families and they would like them to test routinely every two weeks. I'm not quite sure if that's gonna happen in a lot of scenarios, but that is the recommendation out there for them. Um, and one other thing I would add is I did check the hospital capacities throughout Minnesota and our region, and they're really doing quite well. Um, they have plenty of capacity and plenty of PPE and supplies, so um, that's a good thing. Although I did note this morning that nationally they've seen hospitalizations jump up just a little bit in certain areas, and their, their concern is it may be related to some of those new variants, um, and so just kind of navigating that and doing that testing and you know stay tuning on what comes from that. Vaccines, so we again um, made some progress. This was from yesterday's update. So again, each day it does get updated, but there's a few days delay in there. Um, we continue to be in the lower portion in the Minnesota range, especially here throughout our region, but we're making progress. So good things to note there. Um, for our 65 plus, we're almost at 40%. I think this morning's number is 40%. So we know we still have some work to do there. Some of our questions are, how many more are there? So we know this is out of the total population of 65 plus. How many more do want to be vaccinated? Have we reached them? So that's what our work is really this week. And I'll talk a little bit more about that once I get through the rest of the slides. We had a busy week last week. We put out 1,400 doses and our government center, thank you very much. Um, we had some congestion and we had to work through a few areas where um, registration took a little bit longer. We had a lot more people who registered by phone. And so when they came to the door, we had to do some additional work 
while they were here. And so that certainly delayed the flow in. Um, we had a few lined up all the way back here to the boardroom and we needed to put some chairs there so people had a rest break before they actually got into the clinic setting. But overall, it still went very quickly and very, very well, but just making sure that when we have those big clinic stays, about you know six to 700, that we have those things in mind as we plan for those future clinics. Um, I don't know what that is. Keisha, do you want to catch that? Uh, this week, we again have a big week. We have 1,300 doses going out this week. 800 of those doses are second doses, so those are filled and, and they're scheduled. We have 500 new doses, and I think as of this morning, we still have about 300 appointments to fill. So staff are calling a lot of those folks who don't have the email access to try to get them registered, and we have pushed out a lot of emails to a lot of people. Uh, the faith communities, the VA, um, Council on Aging, any of our partners who really have a connect to our senior population, um, we're pushing it out. We've also heard from partners at CentraCare that they have openings this week, and they're too trying to get the word out that they have appointments available. So I think we're kind of reaching this space where we do have appointments. We just need to make sure that this is the right time and the right place for our residents to come in and get them. Nicole, I yes. have a, a question. I think part of when I look at um, what's out there and stuff, so many people seem to be focused on these mass areas that like down in the cities at the convention centers and stuff. I don't know if they're really thinking about going to their county website and actually trying to facilitate it there as versus trying to get into that bigger group. Um, so I don't know how we can reach our county residents in regards to our 65 plus. I don't know if we should be putting out something where we can share on the forums possibly might be helpful, but you guys are gonna have to decide how you think that we can get that message out there. So today actually um, uh, one of the nurses this morning is calling all the senior housing um, places, So, and I'll be helping her hopefully later, and really trying to get a good pulse. Have they already been vaccinated? What does that look like? Do they have transportation barriers? Do they, you know, whatever it may be, we'll try to triage a little bit and see how we can get them in. Um, I will say some good news. We had over 2,000 just on our Sherburne County interest list form for 65 plus, over 2,000 for our non-Sherburne. Um, and we are down to less than 700 on each of those that we know can be removed. So when we sent out last week's request for signing up, a lot of people responded and said, thank you for the offer, but I've already been vaccinated. So we're taking those off that we know we can. Um, and those that we've reached by phone, then we certainly will take them off. We do have um, about 200 or so new folks, so we've really outreached to them this week. That was from last week. Um, and we know for sure that you know we've, we've done at least 500 in the area that said, yep, we're all good. We got vaccinated locally at a pharmacy or at our local clinic. My concern is um, in regards to when we're gonna be able to transition into that next tier and it sounds like we have to wait for the state to make that call. So like the entire state has to feel that we're, we're ready as versus we as a county might be ready. And I'm sure there's other counties that are dealing with the same situation that you're in this holding pattern of trying to, um, um, you maybe have reached everybody you're gonna be able to reach in your area, but you can't go on to that next tier. Um, I had a, a pretty good conversation with the data folks at MDH yesterday, and I asked them to dig in a little bit more. Since I know that we're low, and I know I don't have a, day, a, a, a specific number, but I know we vaccinated a lot of folks that don't live in Sherburne County, especially our E through 12 group. There are many teachers that teach in this area that do not live in Sherburne County. And so I'm trying to get a feel of, is that the same case for our Fairview Clinic, for our pharmacies? Where are people going for their health care? If they're on a waiting list for Alina and that's not in Sherburne County, um, have they been offered already and are they waiting to go through their medical provider? So trying to get a little more detail so we can be a little more strategic in where we do need to outreach. And I think too that um, I joined a um, Facebook group that's Minnesota vaccination, um, it, it, it's basically a group. And it's amazing the amount of people that are actually thinking that they have to go to Dakota. And that just boggles my mind when it's like, okay, we have vaccinations that can be available and we're working to try to find people to fill those spaces and people are driving to Dakota. <laughs> 
some of the people that are driving to other states are um, seeing that they have more flexibility. So those with chronic conditions or disabilities that are not 65. Okay. So those under that age group, I know are seeking some of those other states who are um, a little more open about who is, who is the priority group right now. Um, but you're right. It, it, what are we missing that they're not knowing that things are available locally? Mr. Colby. So yeah, you guys are doing an amazing job. What I'm finding when I talk to people is whoever gets to that person first. That's where they're going. Yeah. They, they'll drive to Grand Rapids. They will drive to Pine City. They will drive to Anywhere. wherever. Um, even if I suggest to them, let me try to get you in the system because these are generally people without computers or access. So I've done some myself. But they're driving everywhere. And uh, talked to one of my neighbors who drove a friend and they had one extra, so she got one too. So that was a bonus. So yeah, unless you are the person that connects with them directly, and it's not on social media right. with, most, with many people, it's interesting. It That's, is. It's <laughs> and I look back to our first 65 plus clinic, which was at the beginning of February. Yeah. It filled up in 10, 15 minutes when we sent out those links. Last week, it did not fill up in that quick time, and we had a lot of those bounce backs, and thank you, but I've already been vaccinated. And again, this week now, we're running into that same thing. So really trying to be more deliberate about the calling and, um, you know, the, the work with Council on Aging, I think, has been really important, too. So we met with them a couple of weeks ago and talked about Senior Linkage Line. People are calling Senior Linkage Line. They have our information. They've got a script. So we're hoping that that is a good connect for them to really focus locally, um, although, you know, they would certainly give resources wherever um, a person could go. Um, last week, I know there was a lot of people who said, I drove an hour to get here today. So we are serving those outside of Sherburne County. And um, as we continue to get vaccine, you know, that's our directive. We serve, it's a federal vaccine. We serve anybody that is on our list. So um, we're really trying to stay true to that. Are we communicating with other counties as well that, hey, FYI, we've got X amount, um, send people our way if you aren't able to serve their needs? I think um, our region, we're all kind of in the same boat. We're saying, we know there's people, but where are they? Because we're having trouble reaching them today. Um, and again, our central care system too, still saying, uh, we have appointments this week, send people our way. So um, I think just continuing to say, there is more vaccine available. It's not quite as rough as it, as it was a month ago. Keep circling back to those places that you might've tried and felt discouraged about you know, a couple weeks ago. Well, with the Johnson Johnson vaccine starting to hit the market as well. Um, that's why I'm hoping the state is going to maybe be a little more willing to move into the next tier while you're still servicing the 65 plus tier as well. Um, so I just hope they don't delay that too terribly long. Uh, we were informed that Johnson & Johnson is available in Minnesota this week. Um, it will be shipped here and they were asking for those local public health departments who didn't have big vaccination weeks to step up and be able to do that. Um, there's some logistic things about that. It's not in our software yet, so they have to do that. We may not have orders from our medical director, so um, we're working to get those things in place. And I believe what will happen is they'll be pretty strategic about that one dose vaccine. So those populations that are hard to reach that may not have, uh, that have more barriers to get back for a second dose or are more of a transient community, um, those would be the populations that probably would get the Johnson & Johnson first. Yeah, I know it's very, you guys are doing great work with the, somewhat of the constraints at times that are being put on the process. So very much appreciate your guys' hard work and just hopefully the state will hear that let's move this a little bit. Yeah, thank you for that. And again, that was our my last slide that yes, we are continuing to get them out in the 72 hours so that we maintain that uh, good standing with MDH. Um, one other thing I'd like to share is we did get information on that next group this week about food processors. So uh, Mr. Weber was very helpful in helping me decipher who really is in Sherburne County and who are we missing. So we have a list of food processors in Sherburne County um, that we're looking at to say, do we have current relationships with them? What's our capacity to help vaccinate them when we're ready? And so we'll be communicating with the Department of Health. And they're also doing outreach to those local establishments to say, if you already have a plan, can you let us know what that is so we can help fill the gaps? So I would assume that that is coming sooner than later. Perfect. Yeah. And in regards to that, I know that, so we've hit like with our educators, um, bus, the bus driver community, 
Um, now that schools are going back into um, in person, you're going to have more of your um, your food service providers that are in the kitchens, um, your staff that's out on the playgrounds. So we've hit all those as well. Then we have outreached numerous times. Um, yep. Again, this week we we sent it to them again, and then we do have more that showed up, some extra bus drivers and staff that maybe couldn't make it to our last few. So we continue to offer it to any of those. And if they can fill in the spots, we are grateful for that. Thank you for all that hard work. Any other questions? Any other questions for Nicole? OK, thank, thank you. Thank you, great update. All right, Dan, do you have anything you want to add to this conversation? I'll be up in a second. Amanda? I think I'm on the next. Am I on the next slide? Regardless, Dan really likes when I go ahead of him. Um, so uh, I am coming to you today to um, ask for permission for um, to purchase a vaccine management solution. Um, early in the pandemic, we were lucky that the state took their CARES dollars and. Um, purchased PrepMod, which is the end-to-end -end vaccine management solution. It, it um, enters the information into MIC, which is the statewide immunization registry. Um, but one uh, glaring observation is the back end, or the list, as we call it. Um, we have list upon list upon list, um, and it's gotten very complicated. Um, the list to, so Nicole has referenced the uh, COVID interest form. So we have an Excel spreadsheet, a master spreadsheet, of everybody who's completed a COVID interest form sorted by priority group. Um, the state, almost on a daily, sends us different lists, smart lists, particularly around that 1A population of what their records show who we should be vaccinating. We also have a list of folks that get deferred. So come in for their appointments and for whatever reason um, they get deferred. Um, we have our own internal list. So when we have to uh, vaccinate group homes or PCAs or homeless communities or uh, schools, those are our internal lists. We also have our standby list. So who's up next if the appointments, if somebody does get deferred? Then uh, we have the second doses because it's not a one dose. And so uh, there's different deferrals or different no-shows or different people who can't make their second dose appointments. And so we're scrambling to try to get those people appointments and fill in. But sometimes the second doses come on a first dose clinic. And so then what happens to that second dose? It's the same scramble. Um, and so it's um, far more complicated than any one Excel sheet can handle. And the amount of staff time that we dedicate to the list every single day um, has become extraordinary. Um, and so we realized uh, quite a few weeks ago that we need um, some support in here. It's just not cost effective to continue to pour over um, staff time on these lists. So we um, uh, did some due diligence, saw what solutions are out there. I'm sure you're getting emails, Bruce is getting emails, uh, Brian Kamen is getting emails, I'm getting emails, everybody's got a solution. So we didn't vet all of them, but we kind of looked at what other counties are doing and what would be the best needs. Um, we did have demos um, from two of them and then researched a few more. And so really uh, what best meets our needs is a Qualtrics solution. It helps us prioritize behind the scenes list and again as prioritization into the essential workers and then as we prepare for general population that's going to become more and more important. Um, the Qualtrics solution provides a centralized registration for the user so it's very easy. You know that um, how we send out uh, or how we get give people appointments is we send out a link and that link comes in an email and I think the top bolded statement is do not forward this link and that email gets forwarded multiple times so folks who are not eligible sign up for appointments. Sometimes people sign up twice because they weren't sure the first time goes through so again that creates that that staff manually checking who's um, scheduled. Um, this week we have uh, I think three 16 and 17 year olds signed up. They're not eligible for the vaccine right now 
And so um, the Qualtrics solution helps us um, uh, prioritize that, um, make sure that those who are not eligible in the priority group do not get appointments, and then each person who signs up for an appointment gets a unique QR code. Um, so then it, it helps not to forward that email. It won't, it won't work. Um, and then also it helps remedy that second scheduling dose. So then that's not our manpower, then that um, Qualtrics helps automate that. Um, so it really checks um, almost all of the boxes that uh, we're putting in numerous staff hours to do. And so um, we did it involve IT in the different demos. Really, of course, we want to see if we have capacity within our own IT department to develop a solution. Um, so we worked with IT hand in hand on a variety of different things. And, and uh, this is also coming as IT's recommendation to purchase this Qualtrics solution. I think the RBA requests $87,000. Um, this weekend I got a flurry of emails. Uh, the original price for this Qualtrics solution was $98,000 and we were able to negotiate. Uh, so the total cost is $83,785. And then I think we're still requesting 87 because there's a little bit of contingency in there with an annual cost of $36,000. The prep mod solution, um, is only paid for through 2021, uh, again, through CARES dollars. And so this Qualtrics can actually replace, it can work with PrepMod or replace PrepMod um, as an end-to-end -end, uh, solution. And so looking at cost savings, presuming that we'll still be vaccinating down the road. Also, Qualtrics has numerous other self-scheduling abilities, so we really try to look long-term beyond vaccination, and it really um, helps us uh, tick a lot of other boxes in terms of public health technology needs. Um, and lastly, um, again, the, the cost is, uh, we're asking for $87,000. Um, we are hopeful that whatever comes down from the federal level, that we will be able to seek reimbursement for this solution um, through those dollars. Uh, if not, we did get written, uh, um, written confirmation that this is an eligible FEMA expense. Um, and so if there was nothing available at the federal or if it didn't fit in that bucket, we would then um, seek FEMA reimbursement. And then, uh, of course, the, the last uh, tier effort, if those two didn't work, is that we would take this expense out of HHS reserves. All right. Does anybody have any questions? Any questions for Amanda? Commissioner Madam, Dolan? Yeah. What's the, what's the stand-up time on this solution? Ooh, that was important, thank you. Um, they say that they can it, fully, I think the um, statement of work says four to six weeks, but in terms of what we need for immediate relief, they're able to stand up a solution within five days. Okay. That back end part, yep. All right. And then they'll continue to work on the other parts. Yeah, yeah, that was very important because when you talk about an eight week lead up time, yes. it's not really worth it anymore. Yes, that's yes, good to hear that. That part can be addressed. I like hearing too that <clears throat> this is some technology you're going to be able to use going forward Absolutely. to help um, the staff. Um, I'm assuming this could be a possible diff or addition or different way of doing zinc tree or other things of that nature. Yeah, I, I know it's been a priority of this board um, for again. Um, um, citizens to be able to self-schedule themselves. So as we look into WIC, as we look to free handling home visiting, um, can we utilize this? Also, we do that um, annual community health needs assessment. So this also has some um, technology where it'd be able to help automate some of that process as well, so. Working smarter instead of harder. We're trying. Yes. Uh, when we wrote the RBA, we just rounded it to 90,000 for contingency. So if Thank the board's you. comfortable, you can just say not to exceed 90. And okay. Any other questions? If not, then I would be looking for that motion to approve the purchase and installation of Qualtrics, a vaccine administration appointment management system at an approximate cost of not to exceed 90,000 utilizing the HHS fund reserves if and until such time as reimbursement on options are exhausted. Motion made by Commissioner Barant. I'll second. Seconded by Commissioner Foby. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. That motion carries. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you so much, appreciate it. I did also wanna just make one before we move off of the vaccines and the clinics and stuff. Um, 
Last week, my husband was able to take advantage of uh, getting his vaccine. He's uh, 72, and he could not say enough good things about the experience. Um, just getting here, and it was busy, but the, everything moved very quickly, and he said that it was painless, and he just wanted to make sure that I passed on that. Thank you very much, you guys. Um, your efforts really, really made it work well. Thank you. And I will just add, if you're ever having a bad day, working a 65 and older vaccination clinic will turn that right around because that group is so incredibly happy to get it, and they are funny. They are funny. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they are very happy. My husband has spent the last... Um, couple of months. When can I get vaccinated? When can I get vaccinated? Your turn's coming, honey. Just be patient. <laughs> so thank you. All right, Dan, moving on to the next item on our agenda. Yeah, included it, in your packet was a list of business grant yep. awardees. So we do have about 50% of the funding remaining, and that would entail there's 97 of our applicants showed a need beyond the capacity of the first grant. So there's two formulas we put in your packet for potential to distribute that last out dollar amount. Uh, the first creates a maximum grant amount at 24368 I know that's an odd number, but that's how the numbers worked out. Then everyone below that would get 100% of their need. Or option two, which is what staff is recommending, we just take a percentage of their need. Uh, we capped it at 30000 Obviously, we have a $100,000 need. We did not have enough funding to, to go up to that amount. So we capped it at 30000 like we did for CARES, and we take approximately 83% of their need, and it did work out to the penny at the end with, with that number. So. I was just looking for a little direction. Uh, the two options, the first, uh, let's see, distributes to businesses with a lower need at a little gr greater rate, and then the bottom one distributes it to those with greater need at a greater capacity. So that's why staff is recommending number two is it's both more fair, and B, it gets to those that have the greatest need the most amount of money. All right, any comments or questions to ask of Dan? All right, looking for that motion to recommend uh, which way we want to go on this in a direction to staff. Dan, do we need a motion or are we just giving you a direction on which form? What, what do you think, Tim? I was mainly looking for direction. Uh, direction. Okay. Yeah. Consensus. Yeah. Consensus of direction then? Yeah, I, I think personally, I think the, the equity with option two is, is a nice feature of it. So I, I'd be in favor of option two. Anybody else? Yeah, I think that sounds fine. Okay, and, and talking to Diane, I think we can get those out this week. There might be a few that don't get done because today is the deadline to get checks processed. So. Perfect. I got them working on them already, putting it in a suspended batch. <laughs> but worst case, they go out next week, so we're still well within our deadline on March 15th. So. Perfect. All right. And again, thank you guys for all your hard work on this and getting these, getting this money out to our business community that... I, I can't. I just can't say enough about how well we do it here in Sherburne County. So I appreciate. It. That's because of you guys as staff. And I don't don't think we have our audit results back, but the feedback that Dan and Diane have got from the audit has been fairly positive. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So far. Yeah. Qu Perfect. Quick question, Dan. Can you, uh, after the meeting, can you forward the new amounts that will be in that calculation? Yeah. As far as what. Yeah. The, awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Okay, our next item of business then will be our commissioner correspondence and if, committee uh, reports. Mr. Uh, Madam Chair, if you're okay, we'll do that added item. Oh, that's right, I'm sorry, 6.7, sorry about that. Yeah, and apologize for the confusion on 6.4, but 6.7. I have it written down too, so. Okay. Um, so I will defer to Commissioner Foby to talk about the work of the St. Croix Regional Airport Authority and the ending work of the ad hoc committee as of last week. Yes, we met last week, um, the advisory ad hoc committee. Uh, Felix has served on that primarily, but in his absence, I am the alternate. So wrapping up our business, um, as you probably recall, our two recommendations are the people that we have had forwarded to be part of the airport authority were Jamie Bestian and Brian Myers. So did that some time ago, and then there was an at-large person that was supposed to be appointed by the advisory, or selected, but then approved by our boards once we did that. So looking at all factors, looked at um, who already had been forwarded to be appointed to the authority, 
what skills they brought, what background they brought, things like that, where they lived, where they resided. Um, it was decided to forward, um, oh, where's her? Where's her name? Angie? Angela Ol Olson. Angela Olson, who uh, lives in the Clear Lake area, um, to be that at-large person. So that was agreed upon by the advisory committee. That was forwarded to the authority, which met directly after we met. And then we need to formally approve that as a board, as well as Benton County, Stearns County, and the city of Zimmerman. So thank you for allowing city of, that. City on. of St. Cloud. Sorry, city you said Zimmerman. Yeah. Did I say yeah. Zimmerman? It was good. It was good. City of Zimmerman. What's on that your mind? good. Huh? <laughs> um, uh, city of St. Cloud. So um, I appreciate you adding that to ag the agenda today so we can kind of expedite that process for that new group. So that's why it comes before you today. So any questions or I will make a motion. Any questions for Commissioner Phoebe? Present the motion. Then I will make a motion. I don't have it all right in front of me yet, but that's or still. But I will make a motion that we approve the at-large airport authority uh, board member as Angela Olson. All right. Motion made by Commissioner Phoebe. I'll second. Seconded by Commissioner Dolan. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. That motion carries. Give her a big welcome and thank you for wanting to be involved. Okay, then moving on to the commissioner correspondence and committee reports. Who wants to start? Don't all jump at once. <laughs> Getting back to my calendar here. While you're uh, pulling up that, just okay. a, a quick note. Um, just received an email that this Thursday Senator Benson's bill will be heard. This is the bill to fund the Zimmerman overpass. Um, and they're asking for a commissioner to be part of that presentation. And I'm wondering if, uh, Commissioner Phoebe, if you might be available Thursday. It looks like it's, uh, uh, I'm guessing late morning, but I'll look it up here real quick. I don't know what your calendar is. And if not, if there's somebody who uh, might also be available. I'm, while you're doing your reports, I'll look up the specific time of the testimony. Okay. Great. So. And it's 3 p.m. is the testifying. Yes, I believe that would work well for me. Okay. So we'll put you down for that as well. Thank you. Go get them. That okay. project's on St. Cloud, right, Lisa? <laughs> Right. Okay, Commissioner Dolan, you said you're ready to start? Yeah, I can start us Perfect. off here. Um, I had um, Elk Lake uh, Park Master Planning Project, uh, meeting number two. Um, there's going to be another upcoming uh, public input session uh, getting scheduled mid-April, I think. Um, and it sounds like, Bruce, correct me if I'm wrong, that's sounding like it's going to be at the um, History Center? History Center. Okay. So I'm sure we'll see something about that coming out soon. Um, also, I had a CMRP meeting. Um, that was another kind of global workshop update as far as where that project was. That was kind of an engaging little session. Use some virtual tools to do public or not stakeholder engagement sessions. Um, and I actually just got an email while we were sitting here that uh, uh, our consultants have compiled the results of that. So that'll be interesting to see what came out of that. Um, and I believe that was it for me. Perfect, thank you. Commissioner Brandt. Uh, on the 17th, uh, I did a the community partnership virtual meeting with the school district and also later that day, um, my first fair board meeting. And then on the 18th, um, the AMC legislative conference, uh, the nine to 12, general group and then also afternoon with the um, AMC HHS legislative group um, and then um, on the 24th I listened in on HSE which is NACO's um, call in and then later on there was the Transportation Alliance um, discussion 
um, with Mindad, and uh, and in the evening I listened in on Representative Amher's discussion locally with um, Dr. Bittner for the I IS 728 school district. It was really um, in general about education and so forth um, challenges right now, and. Um, then on Monday, uh, I listened in last night on City of Elk River, some process that they were working on with what we voted on today. So, oh, the abatement with um, <coughs> Sport Tech. Sport Tech, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Anything that's, else? That's all. Perfect. Commissioner Foby. Um, Great River Regional Library Finance Committee and Great River Regional Library Board of Trustees. Uh, Substance Use Prevention Committee. I listened or part, uh, participated in the ISD 728 Community Partners Meeting and just wanted to say publicly that our staff gets shout outs on those meetings almost every time. Dan Weber and Amanda Larson. So just wanted to thank them for all their work. Um, I had a Tri County Solid Waste meeting. I particip participated in the AMZ Legislative Conference on many different, in many different ways, three of the different subject alleged meetings. I kind of had two computers going and took a lot of it in. Um, the TriCap Board, Executive Board met, and the TriCap Board, as I said last time, we are working on replacing the Executive Director who's moving on. I had a couple of AMC Futures meetings. Um, as I talked about before, the airport ad hoc advisory group met, and then immediately following that, the new airport authority met, which was really exciting, and I just want to thank everyone for all the work that we've put in over this many years to get us to this point. It's happening. So that's very exciting. They just kind of had an organizational meeting. They're waiting till Angela is seated till they uh, determine their chair, vice chair, things like that. Um, but really exciting. Um, we had a Rum River One Water One One Watershed One Policy meeting. We're getting closer to adopting or all agreeing on the joint powers entity. Um, realized and recognized that uh, the Mille Lacs Band hasn't been at the policy table. They've been involved in many of the other committees, so we will be working on inviting them to be part of the policy committee meeting in a capacity that they're comfortable with. They are, you know, the Mille Lacs Lake and the reservation boundaries are a part of that watershed. So working on that piece, continually and then last night had a Princeton Airport meeting and today I'll testify this afternoon to the Health and Human Services. Everybody's been super busy. Um, <clears throat> I had on February 17th the Elk River Schools um, Community Partners meeting and Lisa's correct um, there's there was shout outs to Sherburn County and what a great partner they are to work with and the staff is, um, is always there. Um, also had an MCIU uh, meeting, otherwise known previously as the Gang Task Force, on that same day. Um, there was some discussion in regards to um, making sure, I mean, this, this group is a very busy group, um, and our partnership and cooperation with the different counties that um, surround us as well. So. I really always love to see how well they work together and communicate together, um, especially when you see things occasionally that happen that pop up on social media in regards to um, there's a car that gets pulled over, there's some young people in the car in which they find a large amount of um, drugs and such that look like they're for no other reason but for distribution. So. Um, we always have to be aware that we have to protect our youth and protect our um, communities in regards to the gangs that are out there trying to infiltrate all the time. So uh, February 18th had an EDA meeting. 
Um, also that same day, the AMC legislative conference, and I was just like Commissioner Foby. I had dual computers going because I was in different breakout sessions, and uh, you definitely learn to multitask and keep both ears open. <laughs> um, February 19th, had our 7W um, meeting, first meeting of the year, had the organizational um, meeting of electing the um, chair and the vice chair, and um, I was honored to be nominated to be the chair of the 7W um, body along with um, Joe Persky from um, Stearns County is the vice chair. So also introduced our uh, letter of concern. Having these meetings by um, WebEx is challenging as versus meeting in person because there's times for the communication in presenting a letter. It isn't like you can pass this letter out. So I made sure that it got addressed into the meeting minutes um, for recognition and upon that, the discussion was that um, that the um, board authorized a subcommittee to be formed to look at the different concerns into how we address um, the selections of these grant part, um, recipients and stuff and making sure that we're, we're being fair and equitable and creating the process that the TAC committee can be a part of. So I think we're on the right track there. So that was good. Um, but all of the recommendations stood as presented by TAC, so. Sure. Yes. And I just wanna say I appreciate your work on that. It was a tough, tender, uh, dancing around a little bit to navigate. I was in on that, I listened to that meeting. I'm not a part of that, but I listened and I really appreciated your work in navigating a pretty tough subject. Thank you, appreciate that, yes. And I think we'll have a good positive result come out of all of this. So we'll refine the process and get it to work um, better for all involved. Um, also February 22nd, um, had the Sherburne County Extension meeting. I am not on that committee, but I jumped in because Tim had a conflict. Um, very interesting, there was not enough um, um, quorum present, so they didn't really move anything, but it was very informative. Um, they are now looking for um, my district two and Tim districts three. We are, um, they found people to seat in those positions just when they thought they were gonna hit it on all, all cylinders. Unfortunately, they had a member resign from district four and a member resign from district five. So those need to have people to come forward and wanna be a part of that. Um, and that was a very, very, um, it's a fun group. Um, they definitely talk about some great things and some great opportunities for the county and the communities and stuff. So um, moving on then, I also had an options meeting that evening. Um, February 23rd, had the Big Lake Chamber lunch that we were invited to and Bruce and Dan gave a very good presentation. They were looking for an update from the county and they did a very good presentation. We had some good question and answer afterwards. So thank you for pulling that present, that um, PowerPoint together um, and informing our business community what the county is doing. And also uh, February 24th, I had a countywide safe schools meeting um, and a house hearing I attended um, virtually, listened to the um, testifying um, from our Sherburn County staff, and that was Senate File 1202, House File 1587. The um, sponsors of the um, bill are Benson and Wolgamot. Say that really fast. Um, yeah, so that's, um, that I think went very well. So we'll hopefully we'll see. I hear that it's waiting to be moved forward. It's in some committees for what process of um, how it's gonna be worded legal wise. And um, so we'll look forward to hearing more about that. Also attended a Transportation Alliance webinar. And on February 25th attended the same CMRP meeting workshop that um, Tim alluded to earlier. And I think that, anything else? Yes, Bruce. Just uh, one quick postmortem. Um, 
You all mentioned uh, EMC, and Commissioner Foby had asked a question uh, regarding EMC. Uh, Keisha and I did go back and look at things. It's a, it's a large structure, so sometimes it's not super clear. Um, they have five policy committees, and EMC requests that one commissioner be assigned to each of the policy committees. Uh, that being said, if it's not an area that you're passionate about, you know, we, we review that every January when you do your committee assignments. Um, if you just let me know that you don't won't be sitting in on, let's say, environment and natural resources, I'll make sure a staff person covers it because maybe there's more interest for two of you to listen on general government or something, and that's totally appropriate. When it comes to voting, the committees are kind of weird. Um, if they're if there's contentious issues, it's basically one vote per county. Um, and in the past, AMC has been kind of persnickety about commissioners voting versus a staff representative, but it really usually doesn't matter at the policy level because they're not a decision-making body, they're a recommending body. When, you, when it gets to the formal AMC actions, it is, however, one per county, and at, or I should say it's every county has a certain number of votes, every county has eight votes. So in our case, it's the five commissioners, and then there are three designated uh, votes, uh, the administrator, the engineer, and the HHS director. So. When it's a formal vote, Sherburne County typically votes as a block, and we have eight votes. Every other county has eight votes. Policy committees, it's one vote if they care, and that vote usually has to be the commissioner. So if we know there's going to be a vote, if you're the designated commissioner, we'll either get an alternate commissioner or staff will let you know when they're voting and pull you into that meeting. But otherwise, if you do want to sit in on an EMC policy committee that you're not assigned to, just let me know, and I'll make sure staff covers that. And uh, just for clarification, I was only sitting in on government because of the subcommittee Correct. for the housing. So Correct. sometimes that just, you know, it's not that that's my, I know it's not my committee, but that's yeah. where they landed, that subcommittee. Yeah, so. and, it, and you should feel soft and amorphous to be able to do that. It's, it's just, again, I'm trying to get staff to ramp up to be more involved in EMC. And this actually helps me if, if I know, like, there's something in environmental natural resources. So. Right. Yep. Thank you for that um, yeah. clarification. I would like someone to cover environment and natural resources, and if I need to hop in and vote, I will. <laughs> and I would prefer to proxy another. So you want Dave to find somebody to I'm just jump interested in, there. in something else. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. have been for many years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, and I am um, totally comfortable on the 7W as well. Like I said, I was, they popped it into government and. Not the government isn't interesting, but. <laughs> <laughs> Madam Chair, uh, quick on, uh, before we move on to the next agenda item, uh, for future agenda items, um, I wanted to bring up a topic um, for a potential workshop and or um, something that we can put on consent in an upcoming meeting. Um, and that's an issue that both you and I are familiar with, um, with some, some, we'll call it some discrepancies as far as uh, land use jurisdiction and kind of the flow of information surrounding our ag community, our zoning department, the FSA, and some different jurisdictions as far as what what answers um, are given by who and when. Um, kind of an overarching example um, that we've been dealing with is we had a, a farm owner um, that has been farming here for, for numerous years, um, had a typical practice of, of calling the FSA and asking them if, if they needed any additional permits for what they were doing on their land. And the FSA, and I, I literally sat on the phone call with them on speakerphone, and the FSA says, nope, you're fine, go ahead. Um, well, then we end up getting an enforcement issue later because Apparently they needed a permit from us for that, but they were given the all clear from the FSA, so they didn't continue down any further um, as far as that goes. And I just wanna kind of work on lining those up and potentially explore um, refunding um, all or a portion of the penalty that he, was, that he incurred because of that uh, communication lapse between us and some other bureaucracies. So um, if we could give staff some direction to talk about that in the future, it'd be great. Yeah, and um, in regards to what Tim is referring to, I think this would be a great way to hear again, we talk about silos and we talk about different um, um, entities that landowners have to deal with, especially farmers. Um, and this gentleman was just looking to clear some property that he had just recently purchased to farm. 
Um, so he's used to calling those entities um, that he did refer to um, and did nothing in regards to trying to skirt anything. He just thought he had the approval and did not need to deal with the, the county planning and zoning. So I agree with Tim. I think this is something that we should look at to make sure that we are um, following processes that the other agencies are following as well, and we're all in communication to get it on the same page. Commissioner Foley. As long as we're talking about future topics, or I've already, I think, sent something to uh, Chair and Bruce, but I would like us to discuss as a board or have a presentation on or uh, drill down a bit with communication with our public and how we do that. It's just become so blatantly clear to me that we're missing a whole large entity of people that don't have access and never will to these and have no interest in a computer. Um, so with COVID, and yes, they get the paper, but they get an article about what we're doing. So Mille Lacs County has for the last many years done a quarterly newsletter that's mailed to every home and I don't know that that's something we'd look at quarterly, but they highlight different departments in each one. They have a cycle, you can tell. They list their county commissioners with their information. So I just would like us to talk about how we communicate with our public, and I've said before, if you're not guiding that story and you're not putting it out there, people have no clue what you're doing. And we do so many great things in this county that that deserve well, that that printed that goes yeah, right out to someone's so mailbox. I'd love a conversation about yeah. that. And Commissioner Kobe did share with me that um, that periodical that goes out um, quarterly in um, Mille Lacs County, and it was a very very nice. I mean, there was a lot of great information that someone would take out of their mailbox, and I think really page through it and stuff. And I don't want us to lose in the new in the future that we don't that we we keep connected to our print media as well because not like Commissioner Foby said not everybody is electronically connected and and just as a quick follow-on with the um, with the reduction in the number of local newspapers this becomes even more critical uh, so it's it's very timely to look at that and I know Dave would um, be more than willing to help us facilitate that also you know especially with his background is, is what it was but also with what we're facing with the vaccinations and trying to get the word out it's timely to have that conversation yes. um, with respect to the former item yeah we'll look at whether the board uh, whether the ordinance allows for waiver penalty waiver and if if it's discretionary the board could clearly do that and I think what Tim what you're talking about is almost like a good faith exception which is this happened in good faith so we'll we'll explore what the ordinance allows for that penalty waiver on that obviously the fee has to be paid but the penalty is what you're talking about and and you know we do struggle sometimes when agencies that we don't control talk on our behalf and it sounds like there was just a you know I don't know who it was an FSA but you know they don't have the authority as far as I know to say the county doesn't have its role so we have to figure out that communication but ultimately if the farmer acted in good faith and that's your determination we can and I that. didn't get the impression that any agency was um, speaking on our behalf. They just never said, you also need to contact. Well, and, and, and that's the imprecision of communication. The far, you know, the FSA agent in, in follow-up with our staff said that they were only speaking on behalf of, you don't need anything more from FSA. But if that was their intent, but it wasn't right. what was received, the farmer could say, oh, I don't need anything else. Right. So that's where we, you know, as much as I can't tell the FSA person what to say, I know what I tell our staff, which is to say, from the county's perspective, yes. you've done everything you need to do. And then if we have knowledge, we say, however, you do have to talk to DNR about, you know, let's say it's a, you know, a Mississippi River uh, protection permit or whatever. So where's the radar? And, you know, customer service can be here, or customer service can be here, but then it's difficulty if, if, if it's an FSA agent, because we can only say to them, hey, in the future, please remind folks you still need to talk to the county. We actually run into this a lot with townships, as you've, as you've seen recently, where um, sometimes we have people who have to get multiple permits, and mm -hmm. it's always going to be difficult. So we'll take it as a, as a learning opportunity, but we'll look specifically at that penalty waiver issue. Right. Yeah, a great learning opportunity in a way to these different silos and these different um, agencies. They're can communicate. I mean, there really is not that difficult to communicate with each other as to um, 
and that needs to happen. And I'd say that, you know, those land use issues, that's a nice thing to tie into Lisa's suggestion of an uh, overarching communication strategy as far as that goes. Because when you really run into these type of things mm -hmm. are the, you know, it, a lot of it is the ag community because they've been here for decades and decades and doing things, you know, every three or five years and they keep with the rhythm of the way they've done it because they haven't been notified to do any different. So that, that might be a good piece to put into, put into that overarching strategy in general. So yep. yeah, all and, together. and we do have that issue too, that sometimes people don't act in good faith. They will permit shop and then they'll come back and say, well, I was told this. And you know, they're trying to find gaps to get away with things. And, and then of course with solar, we have the opposite issue. The PUC does override the local agency. So it's case sensitive, it's topic sensitive. Um, anything we can do to communicate would be better, yeah. And I, I think that that's a good point out. But we'll get that ready for you. Yeah, thank you. Perfect, thank you. All right, any other committee reports, upcoming meetings, any future agenda thoughts? Hearing none, then I would um, declare that our business is taken care of and adjourn the meeting. Thank you, everybody. And we'll see we you adjourned. all tomorrow night. Yes.